Okay, there's some more exciting news about Feast of Trumpets Rosh Hashanah that I think you might want to know about. Not only are all the other things we talked about, the Parable of the Ten Virgins on Elul 25, and, um, you know, being ready with the oil in your lamps, the extra virgin olive oil of the Holy Spirit, but the fact that the last trump that we know is the last trumpet blast of the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, and they blow the shofar a hundred times, and the last blast is called the last trump. Well, it just also happens to be a fact that the Jewish people believed that the resurrection of the dead would take place, in fact, at this time. And as far back as the 13th century, the original custom of visiting the cemetery was designated specifically for the eve of Rosh Hashanah, and not before. I don't know exactly when the custom was modified, but over time, communities would schedule their visits at convenient times that worked for them up to a month before the New Year holiday. Typically, it would be on a Sunday a week or more before. The custom has changed because of the difficulty of communities scheduling their visitations on the eve of the festival of Rosh Hashanah due to their necessity of preparing for the upcoming Rosh Hashanah festival. Others conclude that they would go on any day in the month of Elul, the month that the king is in the field, when he appears suddenly and takes his subjects with him. So it was customary, clear back to the 13th century, to visit the grave the eve before Rosh Hashanah. And now this has changed due to you know, convenience sake. So I think it would be very important to note that the eve of Rosh Hashanah could denote when the resurrection of the dead could occur. And they have this service called the Kiva Avot, visiting the graves of the ancestors. And this is a Jewish tradition of visiting the cemetery during the High Holy Days. It is a very special Jewish custom that during the Days of Awe, the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, that one visit the cemeteries to consider our own mortality like that of our forefathers and to visit the graves of our ancestors. So what is the custom of visiting the cemeteries during the Holy Days? In the Jewish calendar, there are two very important dates in the fall. The first is Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year when every year one acknowledges the divine as being king over us all. On that day, we celebrate with anticipation the hope of being declared for a good new year by the king. And this is why it was Yeshua's birthday. Though on Yom Kippur the day is more solemn, it is the day of atonement. When we consider God as the king sitting in judgment over us for based on our deeds and therefore we seek atonement for our sins through repentance, prayer, and charity. It is a day of fasting and people wearing white garments like a burial shroud. On this day, we remember that we are but mere mortals who will one day perish and all that will remain is the memory and merit of our deeds. And likewise, it is also said in the Jewish tradition on Rosh Hashanah, the declaration is written in the book of life, who will live and who will die in that year. And on Yom Kippur, the fate is then sealed. So in the 10 days between these two most holy days, one is encouraged to visit the grave sites of their loved ones and teachers to reinforce this understanding in the most vivid way. Although I must make the case that most Jews also come out to visit the graveyards on these days between the high holy days for less pious and mystical reasons. The graveyard visits become a pervasive custom since days of old for more obvious reasons, because when the holidays come to people, just miss their loved ones so much, and it's felt most deeply during the high holy days. It can be overwhelming sometimes 
when someone you love and have spent a lifetime of joyous holiday memories with, and then for them to no longer be there, whew, boy, I can tell you that's the case. And sometimes it just really hits one at the core. As you hear that holiday melody, your grandmother taught you. And as you make that recipe that you and your grandmother or your mother used to make together, and as a mother and father passes away while they remain alive to you in your vivid holiday memories, it can be entirely overwhelming. The Jewish tradition recognizes this, and it has given us several ways of affirming that sense of loss and turning it into soulful remembrance. One is visiting of the resting places of our dearly departed, and the other is special memorial services with solemn prayers that are recited during the midst of the holidays. The Yitzkor service, the name comes from the Hebrew word Zekor, which means to remember. And that is how the tradition of the Kiver Avot, which in Hebrew literally means the grave of the ancestors, has come to be. So here's a field guide to Kiver Avot by Jewish Journal. Jews worldwide mark the approaching High Holy Days with annual visits to the graves of departed loved ones. An ancient custom, Kiver Avot, literally Graves of the Fathers, dates almost as far back as Jews themselves. That you go to the graves of the patriarchs in Hebron and they'll intercede on your behalf, says Pincus Giller, American Jewish University professor of medieval Jewish thought. Even their Talmudic traditions have the notion of people going to the grave of the patriarchs to ask for things. Now, the tradition of visits before High Holy Days began, at least back as far as the 13th century. More recent Jewish history recounts regular pilgrimages to the burial sites of revered rabbis and loved ones in Sephardic and pre-World War II European Jewish communities, on the anniversary of a death, fast days, and other times during the year. Visitors showed love and respect for the departed and prayed for the soul's safe journey to heaven. Judaism is imbued with a variety of teachings and traditions regarding the sanctity of graves, and Jews go to cemeteries with different levels of consciousness, Giller said. Before Rosh Hashanah and during the 10 days of repentance culminating in Yom Kippur, Gravesite pilgrimages take on an even higher level of significance because they come at a time of spiritual soul searching and renewal. Now I'm just reading to you from the Jewish belief about the resurrection of the dead being at the time of Rosh Hashanah. For many, the belief in the eternality of the soul, which some trace to the patriarch Abraham, underlies this custom. Common to all streams of Judaism, spiritual afterlife is embedded in Jewish prayer, tradition, and folklore. Their Kabbalistic theory teaches that the nephesh, one of the three parts of the human soul, stays at the grave after death, making it a portal to God, Giller said. And that concept often translates into the notion of the soul's role as an intermediary between God and the living. Well, we're told in the New Testament, absent from the body, present with the Lord. But during the holy weeks before the high holy days, people are encouraged to do whatever they can to bestow God's mercy for a sweet new year, said Rabbi Chaim Metz of the Chabad of Bel Air's director. There's a separation of the body and soul after death, and the soul remains here attached to this world to gather requests from others. The reason we visit graves is because the soul is still there waiting to take our request to God. Well, let's see, I don't know if that's the same belief that believers in Yeshua have. But from the start of Elul, the Hebrew month preceding the High Holy Days until Yom Kippur, that means asking the deceased to pray on behalf of the living for a favorable decree in a good year. Yeah, this is what they believe, but... To that end, members of Hasidic movements perform kiver avot at the graves of their spiritual mentors. For some Jews, the season's critical themes of forgiveness and repentance um, inspire their kiver avot practice. Repenting and forgiving don't end at the time of death. And sometimes there is unfinished business. 
The High Holy Days provide a framework for reflection on relationships with lost loved ones. Over time, those relationships change, especially as the living come to understand mitigating circumstances that account for the deceased person's behavior and actions while they were still alive. It's an especially auspicious and fruitful time to visit the grave and have a conversation with loved ones in which you forgive and repent. When you come to Yitzkor, you're in a different place regarding your relationship with that person. Gathering at the grave also facilitates healing within families by creating an opportunity to grant forgiveness to one another. Others visit graves to connect with their past and to contemplate the life that they want to live. Rosh Hashanah is a time to plan for the future. And by thinking of the legacy of those who came before us, we consider the legacy that we want to leave. Some religious and ethnic communities have their own unique custom for Kiva Avot. The Kaddish, which affirms the living's relationship with God and elevates the souls of the deceased to their final resting place, is typically recited along with El Mela Rahamim, a plea for rest for the soul that originated in the Jewish communities of Western and Eastern Europe. Sephardic Jews perform Kiver Avot on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, so they begin the holidays with a sense of connection with their families, and they recite the Hashkava, a memorial prayer with separate texts for men and women, and they ask the deceased to pray on their behalf for forgiveness and a good year. Persian Jews add Tehillim, Psalm 119, a Hebrew acrostic in which family members read the stanzas that begin with the letters in their loved one's names. They also bring flowers and rose water to the grave in accordance with Iranian tradition and spices. Some synagogues hold community services before Rosh Hashanah or during the 10 days of repentance. Other customs include placing stones on the grave to mark the visit, which some believe dates back to ancient times when piles of stones were used to indicate burial sites. When Jesus told them how to pray, that the prayer actually came from the Amida prayers. But they pray different blessings, and so let me read a couple of these. The first one says, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, and God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, the great and mighty revered God, the most high God who bestows loving kindness, the creator of all things, who remembers the good deeds of the patriarchs, and in love will bring a redeemer to their children's children for his name's sake, O King, helper, savior, and shield. Blessed are you, O Lord, the shield of Abraham. And I like this one. You, O Lord, are mighty forever. You revive the dead. You have the power to save from the end of Sukkot until the eve of Passover. You insert this part. You cause the wind to blow and the rain to fall. And then you go on with, you sustain the living with loving kindness. You revive the dead with great mercy. You support the falling. Heal the sick. Set free the bound and keep faith with those who sleep in the dust. Who is like you, O doer of mighty acts? Who resembles you, a king who puts to death and restores to life and causes salvation to flourish? And that word would be Yeshua in Hebrew. So you're actually saying, and causes Yeshua to flourish? And you are certain to revive the dead. Blessed are you, O Lord, who revives the dead. So we not only have the last trump blast that corresponds to the rapture of the living believers in the King of Kings, Yeshua of Nazareth, but we also have the resurrection of the dead. So let's talk about the Jewish belief in the resurrection of the dead and what they say, which adds to, you know, kind of, coming to conclusion about the resurrection and details about it that maybe we don't know. But the body returns to the earth, dust to dust, but the soul returns to God who gave it. 
This doctrine of the immortality of the soul is affirmed not only by Judaism and other religions, but by many secular philosophers as well. Judaism, however, also believes in the eventual resurrection of the body, which will be reunited with the soul at a later time on a great and awesome day of the Lord. The human form of the righteous men of all ages, buried and long since decomposed, will be resurrected at God's will. The most dramatic portrayal of this bodily resurrection is to be found in the Valley of Dry Bones prophecy in Ezekiel 37. Read as the half Torah on the intermediate Sabbath of Passover. It recalls past deliverances and envisions the future redemption of Israel and the eventual quickening of the dead. Now this is only pertaining to their own people. In Ezekiel 37, the hand of the Lord was upon me. And the Lord carried me out in a spirit and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones, and he caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. And then he answered to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord." So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a commotion, and the bones came together, bone to its bone, and I beheld, and lo, there were sinews upon them, and flesh came up, and skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. And then he said unto me, prophesy unto the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, then who is the breath? The Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, is wind or breath. Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. And so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet with exceeding great hosts. Now remember, this is what's going to happen to the two witnesses that are killed in Jerusalem for preaching the gospel of Jesus, Yeshua. And they will be resurrected and stand on their feet, and he will put his breath into them. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are clean cut off. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I will place you in your own land, and ye shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and performed it, saith the Lord. Now, some people say that this was the revival of Israel, causing Israel to become a nation, but I don't believe that it is. I believe it's a literal resurrection of people who've been dead for a long time, coming to life and having skin and muscle and sinews put upon their dried bones and he breathes into them like he did to adam and they come to life but the power of this conviction can be gauged not only by the quality of the lives of these jews their tenacity and gallantry in the face of death but in the very real fear instilled in their enemies after destroying jerusalem and callously decimating its jewish population Titus, the Roman general, returned home with only a portion of his 10th legion. And when asked whether he had lost all of his other men on the battlefield, 
Titus gave assurance that his men were alive, but that they were still on combat duty. He had left them to stand guard over Jewish corpses in the fields of Jerusalem because he was sincerely afraid that their bodies would be resurrected and they would conquer the Holy Land as they had promised. The belief in a bodily resurrection appears at first sight because he was sincerely afraid that their bodies would be resurrected and they would conquer the Holy Land as they had promised. The belief in a bodily resurrection appears at first sight to be incredible to the contemporary mind, but when approached from the God's eye view, why is rebirth more miraculous than birth? And of course, we're born again as believers in the Messiah. The Jewish sages simplified the concept of bodily resurrection by posing an analogy which brings it within the experience of man. A tree, once alive with blossoms and fruit, full of the sap of life, stands cold and still in the winter. Its leaves have browned and fallen, and its fruit rots on the ground. But the warm rains come, and the sun shines, buds sprout, green leaves appear, colorful fruits burst from their seed with the coming of spring, and God resurrects nature. And for this reason, the blessing of God for reviving the dead, which is recited in every daily amida, incorporates all of the seasonal requests for rain. And when praying for the redemption of man, the prayer book uses the phrase, Mats Mi'ach Yeshua, planting salvation. Indeed, the Talmud compares the day of resurrection with the rainy season and notes that the latter is even more significant for resurrection, serves only the righteous while the rain falls indiscriminately on all men. I think that's really interesting because that was the whole premise of my book, The Almond Tree, Aaron's Rod, the Messiah, King of Israel. It was the dead of winter when I had the revelation of the almond tree and in Jerusalem, the almond tree was just coming to life. And this lady was drawn to photograph it the third time she passed it. She opened up a revelation from me that she had no idea was coming. And she didn't know me. And she said she knew immediately that Yeshua was the Messiah because of what I said. And that the photograph was taken she said someone very powerful pulled her to the tree to take a picture of it and when she got back and she found my email with the revelation in it it was the dead of winter here and she sent me the picture and she said she knew that it was for me from god so i think that's extraordinary that this Planting salvation is Matzmiach Yeshua. Some contemporary thinkers have noted that the physical revival of the dead is symbolic of a cluster of basic Jewish ideas. First, man does not achieve the ultimate redemption by virtue of his own inherent nature. It is not because he uniquely possesses an immortal soul that he inevitably will be resurrected. The concept of resurrection underscores man's reliance on God, who, in the words of the prayer book, wakes the dead in great mercy. It is his grace and his mercy that rewards the deserving and revives those who sleep in the dust. And isn't it interesting that the church has been saved by grace through faith? And second, resurrection is not only a private matter, a bonus for the righteous individual, it is a corporate reward. All of the righteous of all ages, those who stood at Sinai and those of our generation, will be revived. The community of the righteous has a corporate and historic character. It will live again as a whole people. The individual, even in death, is not separated from the society in which he lived. Third, physical resurrection affirms unequivocally that man's soul and his body are the creations of a holy God. There is a tendency to assume that the affirmation of a spiritual dimension in man must bring with it the corollary that his physical being is depreciated. Indeed, such has been the development of the body-soul duality in Christian tradition 
Judaism has always stressed that the body as the soul is a gift from God, indeed, that it belongs to God. And of course, you know, mankind was made in the image of God, male and female, he made them in his image. So they declare the soul is yours and the body is your handiwork. To care for the body is a religious command of the Bible. Resurrection affirms that the body is of value because it came from God and it will be revived by God. Resurrection affirms that man's empirical existence is valuable in God's eyes. His activities in this world are significant in the scheme of eternity. His strivings are not to be depreciated as vain and useless, but are to be brought to fulfillment at the end of days. Now, I kind of want to leave you with this because in the New Testament, in John chapter 5, verse 1 actually says, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And that's when he healed at the pool of Bethesda. And it goes on, then verse 24 Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And verily, verily, I say unto you, I love this part, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. So he was resurrected from the dead as well. And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now that's kind of an interesting verse right there, because at Rosh Hashanah, during the 10 days of awe, you're being prepared for the judgment, and you either are given life, or you're given death. So that's kind of telling you right there when this time frame is, because... Those who have done good unto the resurrection of life. So you are at Rosh Hashanah, our Feast of Trumpets, you are sealed in the book of life for life or for death, or you're somewhere in the middle. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So I think that that's a proof of Rosh Hashanah right there in that verse 29 of John 5. So was he actually talking about Rosh Hashanah in that verse? And just before that, he's saying that a time was coming when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Is that speaking of Rosh Hashanah in John 5? Now, I also mentioned this before that I find it very interesting that in 1 Corinthians 15, when he's talking all about the resurrection of the body and resurrection of those that are dead, and he's talking about all of these celestial bodies, there's the glory of the sun and another of the moon and another glory of the stars. And he's talking about the glory, and so also is the resurrection of the dead. So it just so happens that we're seeing all of these celestial events right at the time of this particular Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets. And then he goes on to say that famous verse that is in verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So that's one of the reasons you don't want to come back under the law, because Yeshua is the fulfillment of the law. He fulfills all righteousness. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus the Messiah. And therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So, Right there, we know that the last trump is the last trump blown during the time of the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. And those that hear his voice will live. And how will they come to life? Because his breath of the Holy Spirit has been indwelling them while they've been living. And they died in having the breath of God in them that can bring their body back to life and reconnect it with their soul, which shall come down from heaven at the glorious appearing. The Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Messiah shall rise first. And then those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, in the cloud. And so... Shall we ever be with the Lord? Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So, Rosh Hashanah has been seen as the time of the resurrection of the dead. And remembering them. And remember, I told you on Elul 25, I discovered that they light five candles, which really stands for the five wise virgins that are prepared to meet the king who appears suddenly and comes down to meet his subjects. And that the five candles really represent the five wise virgins who had the oil of the Holy Spirit in their lamps because they will receive eternal life. And I don't want to make this video too long, but considering this verse in John 5, where he's speaking about those who have done good will receive life, and those who have done evil will receive death, is just exactly what they talk about at Rosh Hashanah. You're sealed in the book of life or the book of death, or you're floundering somewhere in the middle. So with that, I'll just say, please give a like to the video. Please support my work. Um, I go the extra mile to bring you such incredible things and revelations of my own that are very unique. And um, also, if you want to read the most incredible, huge manuscript about Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, for the last days in revelations about him that have never been known, my book, The Almond Tree, Aaron's Rod, The Messiah, King of Israel, spells it all out. It took seven years of writing with an eighth year editing, and it's a huge volume. And it was accepted at Harvard University Library through a Judaica endowment. And it's available at olivepresspublisher.com. It's also available at online bookstores. But it's better if you order it directly from my publisher. Because like Amazon, they keep all the proceeds pretty much. So um, they didn't even do the work. <laughs> so anyway, with that, I'll just say... I'll see you in the next episode. Keep your eyes and heart prepared to meet the king. I do get my hopes up, but I have to keep my excitement in check because to me, expecting to see my mother again and my father and grandparents and everybody that's died, it's really difficult to project seeing them and then have it not happen. So I'm very cautious but excited at the same time. So today was the Ring of Fire, which was not visible in the United States. From what I understand, it was only visible in parts of Hawaii. 
And um, also tonight, October 2nd, is the new moon, which is actually the fully darkened moon. There's no light on it. And then the two witnesses used to go up on the Mount of Olives and sight the first crescent sliver of light coming on the new moon, and they would announce it uh, with shofar blasts on to on the mountain to try to um, you know give everybody the signal that the festival had begun and that God's holy convocation could begin. The high holy days of the Lord and the time of the resurrection of the dead and the time of the last trump of the rapture of believers. Truly extraordinary. I'll see you in the next video.